I'm Alan Moon. I've lived in Thunder Bay for since 1977. And uh, I came here, the government sent me here to uh, help open the office, uh, Northern Affairs office. And uh, I worked there until 1981. And I was sort of suffering burnout. So uh, I had been doing pottery and I thought, okay, I'll take a year off. I'll do the pottery while I make sure that I don't starve to death and then I will uh, find my next career because this was all the government one was already most likely my fourth career so um, I had pottery one year did okay have a garden you know so then I thought oh, I'll do another year and so our sales all the potters our sales were going up, the city was getting interested, and then it was a third year, and then it was a fourth year, and now it's 37th year, something like, like that, that I've been doing pottery since 1977, no, full time 1981, so that makes it 39 years, so 38 pottery years. pottery has supported you all these years? Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. Not many artists can support themselves. Yeah. No, it's uh, um, the the June fairs that we had out at George Lannan's place. People got really excited about it. We were there they uh, doing, as I said, raku and doing demonstrations on the wheel and hand building so people could come and they, they met all these different uh, uh, clay people and uh, um, we got... They got interested in us, and our workmanship was good. And uh, the city, we think, the Potter's Guild thinks that per capita, most likely we are the, the best um, pottery city in all of Canada. Wow. Per capita, buy more pottery than any place else. Because if you figure Toronto, maybe six million people, how many millions of dollars are spent on pottery in Toronto? Okay, but here we've, all of us have done really quite satisfactorily. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a good, uh, a really good city. And now you just see art in all kinds of art. And we think there's kind of a second wave because it had really been good in the 80s, 90s, and then kind of um, tapering off. And now this, uh, what do you call it, a uh, craft revival. It just looks like there's a huge amount of the population, the younger population, getting really interested in craft revival. So I think that Thunder Bay and its crafts are going to take off, or are taking off really well again. That's so, wonderful for the yeah, city. Yeah. It's, it's really quite exciting, you know. And... Uh, I can I can retire except I I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not doing near as much work as I did before um, because I don't have to, and so there's not that sort of pressure on me all the time to uh, uh, get more work done. I had a chart on the wall of my studio, and I would put down what I'd made each day and its retail value. Usually between one and two bags of clay. There's two bags of clay in a box. A bag of clay um, is uh, 22, 22, yeah, it's 40 kilo, 22 pounds of clay in a bag. So uh, if I did uh, mugs, then I would make 20 at a time. And then maybe I would go and do a couple of other things as well. Uh, working on the wheel, it takes about uh, two hours of work on the wheel, and you've got another 10 to 12 hours of work to finish that so it can go on sale. What do you make on the wheel? Uh, everything. I just work on the wheel. So so anything that goes that is round. A bowl, a, a, bowl, a, a vase, a pitcher, a casserole, a plate, um, so, dish, yeah. yeah, oven dishes, yes, yeah. 
So anything that's round in pottery, we can distort the pieces, and sometimes you do, and there's there's techniques to, to make oval pieces out of round pieces and things like that. Um, but uh, most of us, um, especially in, in the past, really like to, to work on the wheel. It looks like magic. It's hard work. It's... Um, it's always fascinating watching another good potter, no matter how good you are yourself. You, you just watch somebody else and you see this piece grow out of nothing. And I had one little kid ask me, or ask his mother, you know, does he have clay hidden in his hand? <laughs> because I was starting either a bowl or a mug, and you know, it's just a lump of clay like this for a mug. And it was getting bigger and bigger, and he was wondering whether it was some kind of, <laughs> you know, and had it hidden in my hand, and it was coming up. So, yeah, it's it's really fascinating to watch a good potter. And uh, I, like I said, pottery is is maybe my fifth or sixth career, and pretty much each one helped the next one especially by the time when I was working for the government because I had worked in forestry in British Columbia. I had worked in mining in Labrador. I in summer jobs at uh, university were in, in recreation and recreation planning. So when I came to, to Treasury in Toronto, then we were doing a planning project for all parts of Ontario. And I was working on the Northern Ontario one part of that. I was part of that team. And so I had mining, forestry, recreation, cross-cultural stuff, uh, working with First Nations uh, both in Saskatchewan and, and Labrador. I was, uh, I was producing full-time, and the city was a great support. But without the rest of the Potter's Guild, I could not have managed at all. Pottery is extremely technical. And it's lots of frustration and lots of the technical stuff we could go to each other and usually find an answer for a problem. To try and do pottery on your own in isolation is, I would uh, suggest, pretty much impossible. So unless you spend lots of time at school going to universities and, and colleges and courses and stuff like that. But here, because of our isolation, we were all good together and we helped each other and so the sales got better and the quality got better. Business-wise, we got better as well and the public really appreciated it. So all these things worked together and, you know, the, George Lannan, for example, he was one of the founding members of the Guild. Well, he was in insurance, and he was in real estate, and he was in all kinds of stuff. The man was a, a natural entrepreneur. So he looked at all of us, and we're all scrambling, where can we get our supplies and stuff? So he starts a supply business. He just decides, okay, we need all these, these things, and he just goes and orders and uses his garage at the, as a shop. So that made it really easy for us. Uh, Jake, uh, natural teacher, so he would do lots of uh, lots of the teaching, and then the Ontario Potters had started the same time as the Potters Guild in Thunder Bay, so they were a source of slides of what other Potters were doing around Ontario and around Canada, and they had a loan system, so every meeting we usually had a slideshow so we could look at other people's work and uh, get ideas and, and get uh, motivation for uh, better quality or uh, more originality or whatever. Usually there would be uh, between 25 and 40, but um, in terms of active people working on on the wheel and making clay things, usually between 15 and 20. Before that, there was uh, Artisans Northwest for a little bit. There might have been some of the, some of the members, of the founding members of the Potter's Guild were in that. Okay. And uh, there was another craft 
group, um, but it it included that's before I arrived, and it included um, fabric people and weavers and uh, all kinds of different things. And there wasn't, I guess, enough focus there for the potters because, uh, especially under Jake, you got really keen and uh, wanted to to push on. So uh, forming a guild apparently was the best way to to advance themselves uh, as quickly as they could. So um, um, anyway, so there was George, there was, and then there was Bill Eames, Bill and Jane Eames. Um, Bill was Canadian, Jane had uh, learned her clay in England, and uh, so they were already doing some as well when they, they were part of the founding of the, the Potter's Guild. And uh, um, I said Betty Trombley, she was teaching at the college, so there was a lot of different things. Edie Hashiguchi was one of the founding members, and uh, for a while she ran classes, would it be Franklin Street School over in Fort William, I think? So anyways, we got more cohesion and, and focus, and, uh, and now we've been going for Potter's Guild started in 76. So, Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we always cooperated with the university. If we had these uh, big weekend workshops and the students got in at a very cheap rate uh, to attend them, so that expanded their education and the university in turn allowed us to uh, um, use their space for these workshops. And we have a collection of more than 150 pieces uh, of work from these workshops, so including people from England and from the States and all over Canada as part of that collection in the university for the students to, to use. And as much as anything, it looks like the drawing students use those pieces for, for drawing practice. So art. Being a potter, even though we had our Potter's Guild, you're there in your studio by yourself. And if you're trying to make a living, 12 hours a day, six days a week. When it comes to sale time, 16 hours a week, seven days a week. You know, for maybe the month before, or something like this. So you need to get out. And without the Potter's Guild, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stayed at it. I'd have gone on to, to something else, who knows what. You need to get away sometimes too. And I'd always been interested in uh, Korea for a long time. And I had a Korean friend in uh, Toronto, and I said to her one time, well, there must, there must be uh, on the internet, we must be able to find some place where I could go for a month or so in Korea. So she got on, on the internet, and we found uh, things of about two or three different shows there, and with the list of the people who were in the show, and one looked interesting, and the, most of the, the, there was only six in the show. They were real top, top people and said, okay, let's start with this one. And if they don't have anything, we'll go to the second and the third. So we phoned the first one, which turned out to be Kim Jong-ok and uh, found out when I got there that he was a national treasure. Had no idea at all. Uh, Sung Chol talked to him and said, there's this Canadian here, he's a potter, he would like to come. Mr. Kim said, come. It could have been that I couldn't <laughs> do anything because lots of potters who think they can do something, uh, you know, they say, oh yeah, I'm a potter. And when they turn up, they can't do it. So Mr. Kim took that chance. And anyways, I went there and he said, well, you can, he, he had, um, Several junior, he had his son and a couple of junior people as well, just doing uh, stuff. So he said, you, you can stay here and just visit around Korea, or you can go to the, the studio and help out there. And after hours, you can use the wheel if you want to. And uh, so naturally, I went into the studio, and a couple of the other, other junior people would give me jobs to do. And uh, so we do that. and. Uh, then <clears throat> after after supper time, I'd uh, go back in, and usually the, these young people were there too, um, practicing, and so I'd demonstrate uh, 
or I'd make things and demonstrate to them and try and show things uh, without any language, really. And uh, so that, that worked out really well. And at the end of the six weeks that I was at his place, he uh, said there's... Um, uh, there was this festival that he had, he and some other potters in Moongyang. Moongyang is a, a small city in really in the mountainous part of Korea, right in the middle of the country. And so rather cut off, uh, traditional pottery uh, was really, really important. And uh, he and some others had started this festival. And the, the goal was to make it international. So they'd started off just sort of local, and they'd got it up to regional, and they'd got it up to national, and they wanted to get a bunch of foreigners in there as well. And they already had uh, a couple of Japanese and uh, maybe one Chinese guy or something. And so Mr. Kim invited me to come as a, as a foreign potter uh, to help achieve their goal of making this an international uh, uh, festival. And their focus was wood firing and uh, functional and tea bowl work. And tea bowl is, is a special ceremony and, and way of, of drinking tea and oh, relaxing and that yeah. sort of thing. Okay. So anyways, I was invited 77. He invited me back in 78. And 70, uh, in, but 78, I didn't go. I went in 79, I think. Anyway, so I went several times and made friends with other potters there and uh, was able to uh, uh, manage to get Tim Alexander invited uh, one year and uh, a potter from uh, Winnipeg uh, one year. Uh, she was invited because I just give these names in. And uh, while I was there, there, the second year I was there, um, there was potters from Europe, quite a few from from Europe had been invited. And uh, one of them is uh, Uta Dreist. Uh, and uh, I talked to her on the telephone yesterday. So I met her in 79. And uh, um, she and an English potter, um, I, I got the English potter invited and then she and Uta became fast friends, and uh, I visited Uta now in, in Germany a couple of years ago, visited her with a Korean potter that, who came to my studio, and then uh, the one year we, we met up and all went to Uta's place in Germany. So from just being in Thunder Bay and, and needing to get out a little bit and then now I have uh, friends in many places, Aus Australia, New Zealand. I have pottery friends as well. So, Fantastic. yeah, that's great. Yeah, and Thunder Bay's name is is out yeah. there too. Yeah. When uh, uh, we Thunder Bay visited its sister city in Japan, Gifu, uh, back uh, maybe 19, 2012 or something. I don't know. Um, so. I uh, I thought, okay, Japan is so famous for its pottery. So I wanted to um, meet some some potters from Gifu. I was sure there would be potters in Gifu. Turns out there aren't. And, and uh, I wanted the, uh, the symphony had just taken, just made a, a CD. So I took the CD uh, with me to our couple of copies to give to their symphony. And uh, then the people in Gifu found a potter for me to talk to in, uh, in Gifu. And they also arranged for all of us to go to a couple of amazing pottery universities this near Gifu. Japan. This is in Japan. <coughs> Very good. Yeah. yeah, so whereas the, the Thunder Bay people would not have seen anything about Japanese pottery if I hadn't gone and, and wanted to meet some. Now, the potter that they introduced me to, they found somebody who could speak English. So this fellow, this man, he was an engineer. He did geophysics survey 
air surveys all over northwestern Ontario. What a small world. He, he had an engineering company in Toronto, and he had done geophysics all over, which is mining, which is, yeah. again, my sort of background. And then he'd retired. His son has the company now. And there I am in, in Japan talking about northwestern Ontario with... So it's amazing. Yeah, it's great fun. <laughs> yeah. And he had, he had a small kiln that he could do both electric and gas. And that's uh, uh, quite different. And he, because he was an engineer, he built it himself. And, and uh, so anyways, uh, we haven't tried to build one here yet, but uh, we might. Anyways, that was, that was the question I wanted to ask you. Do you have your own kiln at home, or uh, every everyone uh, everyone does right. who's doing work and selling it? Yeah, you need you need that. Do you have both electric and wood, or uh, uh, I had electric and and uh, gas for salt glaze. Um, there was uh, in Red Rock, uh, they had gotten. Um, I'll remember his name. A potter from uh, uh, North Bay. And he was, uh, he'd, he'd graduated from Seneca just a few years before, and he'd got a, a truck trailer and uh, with a kiln and a wheel inside and uh, went around uh, to giving workshops and uh, building uh, salt kilns for salt glazing. It's a kind of, of glazing we associate with the German uh, steins and this sort of thing, the old fashioned ones. And uh, so a kiln had been built in Red Rock. And uh, there used to be a group um, of, uh, of craftspeople that met once a year in northwestern Ontario, just the northwestern Ontario, all the craftspeople. And one year it was at uh, Nipigon Red Rock. So we were invited, the potters were invited to make work and come down and fire it in this uh, uh, salt kiln. And uh, so I did a little bit of homework and, and uh, gave a kind of a lecture to our people so they knew what to, uh, to do with the surface of their pieces so that we could fire them in the salt kiln. And uh, that turned out quite well. And then uh, Trudy Jameson and I continued salt glazing for about uh, five more years five or six more years, and then that kiln was really finished because salt is, is very hard on brick and it kind of eats it away. And uh, so we, we fired in that kiln because uh, the Nipigon Red Rock people had, uh, uh, the few that were doing clay uh, weren't doing it anymore. Uh, Gert Cantley was, it was at her place and she was really good, but she was getting older and and not interested anymore. And you needed to make quite a bit of work to fill that kiln. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so we got the chance to use that and to learn more. And uh, so that was another aspect of kind of uh, pottery that can be made and was made here as well. And so, you know, that was another um, really uh, great experience and uh, especially for for me then the more i travel the uh, i have this background from all these different things you know fritz lemberg is uh he was firing mainly with used oil from uh, trucks and cars and stuff like this and tim is firing with wood and and fritz it was wood and oil so uh, uh, there's all these kinds of backgrounds that really help us uh, to be wider in our knowledge skills appreciation yeah so but uh, now i'm i'm got these friends in korea they're always saying come on come come back come back come back and uh, like i said i just talked to to uta and it was so good because isu this is the korean potter she came from korea over over asia to berlin and myself, I came from Canada and met up with uh, Vivian uh, Legg in, in London. And then she and I went on to uh, Berlin and then we drove up to 
Uta's place, and there was all kinds of other craftspeople in that area. It's in East Germany, old East Germany. So uh, lots of craftspeople had gone there because it was housing was inexpensive, and there wasn't wasn't the industry, and uh, so there was in inexpensive housing which craftspeople needed, and and room for gardens and stuff so you can feed yourself. Yeah, I've been very lucky, and. You know that, like Trudy Jameson, she uh, John John was a prof at the university here, and so for years uh, they traveled first in his sabbaticals, and now he's retired, and uh, so she's met potters in Australia, and potters in New Zealand, and potters in France, and I've met potters in France as well, and uh, pottery is a, is a thing you can find find these people and almost always not quite always but almost always they're wide open they come on in and you look around and you're really friends with them they're very friendly and and usually in interesting places so pottery has given many many of us a chance to make connections when when we're outside the city and to oh, one t one time, this is not quite on that topic, but um, I think I sent a note to the English Ceramics Magazine because uh, about our salt glazing. This is when Trudy and I were still salt glazing and talking about getting a really uh, nice gold from, uh, uh, it's a titanium mineral, a slip, and I was getting a nice gold. and. That, that that was a small note with a picture, and that went into an English ceramics magazine. And about six months later, I've got I get a letter from Australia to um, the best potter in Thunder Bay. I think it was titled with no address, and it came to my house because it had my name on it. The best potter. <laughs> so yeah, something like that. I think I still have the letter tucked away in a book someplace. <laughs> So here's this guy in Australia, sees this thing in from an English ceramics magazine and, and you know. There you were. Yeah. 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 And fun. It's fantastic. Yeah. And we did a, another thing. Uh, Trudy and I did a show yeah, at our museum here when it was in the old building, which is now the uh, sports uh, museum that used to be the, the Thunder Bay Museum. And uh, we did a show in there of salt glazed work, and so I have uh, I have numerous, maybe a hundred catalogs of that. If anybody's interested, still in my basement or in my studio. And uh, then the Potter's Guild as well did a um, when the new museum just opened, um, the whole thing was empty, no walls or anything like that. And we did a 25th anniversary show in that museum. That was the first show they had. And we were able to get work um, and group it by five years. For first five years, second five years, third five years, and have these around with the different people. And, and uh, that was a really interesting show. I have no idea whether there's any uh, record, photo record. There must be, but whether the museum uh, made photos of all that or not. But anyways, that was a quite important show for ourselves anyways. And that was 25 years, and now we're, we just passed 40, so. Oh, yeah, it's very fulfilling. Uh, comments like, uh, uh, I never thought I would work on an assembly line. I couldn't imagine working on, a, on an assembly line, but, that's really what pottery is. You know, like I said, um, a bag of clay, I usually make 20 mugs. Mm -hmm. So 20 at a time, and then put 20 handles on the next day, <laughs> and then decorate 20. And then, so it's a little bit like an assembly line. And, uh, but you try and make different shapes and different sizes just to keep yourself fresh. Right. I thought, uh, you know, you read in the, in the, ceramic magazines and stuff that this guy's into production and he's making a hundred mugs a day and that and I tried that 
And I said, never again, because it is far, far, far too boring. So your work loses its freshness right away. So better to do, do enough, you know, the right amount. And for me, that's 20 and 20 handles. And then for the rest of the that day, you know, you're doing other, maybe you're making some casseroles or maybe you start some teapots. Teapots are really hard to make. There's so many parts and they gotta go together well. And uh, goblets are really difficult as well. They're really not worth the effort, but you gotta do them anyways because you need the variety. You know, so, uh, and for a long while there, I was making pictures and I loved making pictures. I haven't made any for years now, but you can take the same shape and put a handle on in a different place and you change the character of it entirely. And so it was really uh, interesting to me to have long necks, short necks, handles here, handles there. And, and uh, yeah, for three, four, five years, I would say it was really quite fascinating to be doing those and, and seeing the differences that, that resulted. And then for bowls, it's the same sort of thing. You can have flat bowls that are just like this or with a very high foot or various shapes that close in or that open out. And each one will have its different character and a lot of them in Chinese or Korean or Japanese will have different names because they see them as summer bowls, winter bowls, this kind of thing, tea bowls, just for regular bowls. And uh, so when you go into other cultures, you begin to see some of the things that they see in pieces that Europeans, uh, you know, never thought about because their aesthetics are different. And if I hadn't flunked out of high school. I was a high school dropout. Yeah. See, I, mean, I did two, two years in grade 13, like I said. For in those days, to graduate, you had to have your senior matric which was English literature and a second language. So I, I, I had English composition when I was in grade 12. I had grade 13 English composition, but the English literature I never got. I thought, I, I enjoy literature. I'm not going to cut it all up into pieces and memorize all this stuff. So I'm quite stubborn. And uh, then the, the French, uh, French became uh, my second language for, you know, I've worked in France, I've studied in France, and, and it's, uh, but I, I didn't pass it out of high school. And uh, then uh, what else? Well, if I had gotten married, of course, it would have been totally different because I wouldn't have been home free. I would have had all kinds of responsibilities and stuff. Yeah, you would not mm. have traveled the world like no, you've done. No, no. You know, and the Koreans, of course, family and, and children and stuff is really important for them. And so I get that question all the time over there. But I would say, I couldn't be here if if I had gotten married. I couldn't Your have done this or that. If, yeah, so anyhow, you know, you you win some stuff and you lose some stuff and that's that's the way life goes. So. Yeah. Like at the at the buskers, for for two years now at the buskers festival, the the potters have been there uh, making bowls for empty bowls. Right. Yes. Okay. So that's another thing. Uh, we've supported empty bowls. It was their twentieth anniversary. It was their twenty first uh, dinner last October. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's because the potters are here. So we've been able to help with that, and I think. Uh, we've raised maybe close to $300,000 over those 20 years now. But a lot of that is from the quilters and from other people doing other stuff. You know, when you honestly look at it, it's the potters don't produce a lot of that money, maybe a third, maybe of a quarter. But without the potters, the whole thing wouldn't happen. And uh, at the auction, the, the art auction at the art gallery, which is once a year, there's always pottery in there. And the pottery always uh, brings a good price in there. 
So we're able to contribute to the whole community and we feel that's part of our job as well as a, as a guild, as a group, so yeah. That's awesome.